um, used to uh, come on up, Deborah, if you would. Used to live here in Oklahoma City. She was on the staff. She was the highest ranking female in the Southern Baptist Convention of Oklahoma. Uh, although she wasn't treated as an equal, even though she was the highest ranking female on the staff. And uh, she has since moved to Mississippi. And uh, she brought to my attention about uh, the Southern Baptist Church. And we're not against the Southern, you know, I, I need to say this again to make sure. I think we've said it, but we'll say it over and over again. We're not against Masons. We're not against Muslims. We're not against Mormons. We're not against Roman Catholics. We're not against Southern Baptists. We're not against the people. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. You heard about uh, uh, what Mildred said about Diane. She cares for the people. If you love people, you want to be free, don't you? So we're, de- we're talking about the principalities and powers behind all of this so that people can be free. And so as uh, Deborah talked to me about the Southern Baptist sites, she and some others uh, went on a trip to pray over and deal with the Southern Baptist sites. I guess it was a year before last. Was yes, it? 2008. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But she brought to me something else that I hadn't really thought about. You know, Satan demands blood. Jesus offers his blood. Human sacrifice empowers the enemy. Now, I don't fully understand all of that, but I know it's true. And I never thought about what she's going to talk about that has defiled our land in a major, major way. And I wanted to present this for us to ask the Lord what, when, and how we're to do something about it. So let's welcome Deborah Brunt, please. Welcome back to Oklahoma. Thank you. I have a handout. Or did you get that they're available and while the handouts I seem really okay we're working on that while the handouts are going out would you all stand up you don't mind doing that do you ah. and yes yeah, stretch when I, I left the Southern Baptist Convention I literally left the Southern Baptist Convention in 2005 and when I walked out the door at the end of, at the beginning of May and walked into Oklahoma Apostolic Prayer Network in June. <laughs> so um, my, my, my feet haven't quit dancing. Every time we have worship, I cannot stand still because for 50 years my feet couldn't move. So now they move whenever there's worship. Yes. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. Ah, okay, I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer. And that prayer is to ask the Lord to pour out on us, this, in this few minutes, the spirit of grace and supplication. Now, you know that is a promise for Israel. He is going to do that for Israel. But we're like the dogs that want the crumbs. You know, it's like, Lord, in Jesus, we would like this too. Now, I have to warn you, though. What the Bible says about when you... When the spirit of grace and supplication is poured out, do you know what is the very first thing that happens? We look on him whom we have pierced. So that's what you're asking. Now there's some other things that come after that, and they're all wonderful. When we see him whom we have pierced, and we mourn as one mourns for an only son, in that day the land is cleansed. On that day, the idols go down and their names are remembered no more. On that day, the river flows out to the east and the west uh, over the whole land. And on that day, the Lord is the king over all the land and his name, the only one. Now, I'd say that's a fair price to pay (laughs) for that spirit of grace and supplication to be poured out. But it's up to each of us to ask for it. So would you just pray aloud and ask the Lord yourself for the spirit of grace and supplication to be poured out. Father, you have told me yourself, and you have told me through Apostle John, don't hold anything back. And so we ask you, Lord, please, God, don't hold anything back. Would you pour out on us in this place as as just a beginning point, Lord, on this place, on this land, 
on the people of the world a spirit of grace and supplication, Lord. So that everything you promise in that aftermath can come to pass. Because, Lord Jesus, you are the only one. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as you may or may not know, we are rapidly approaching the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. Now, when I say that to people, sometimes they say, well, like, uh, particularly where I live in Mississippi, right outside of Memphis, Tennessee, they say, oh, can't we get past that? Well, let me say to you what I believe the Lord is saying to us in this season, and it's up here on the slide. I believe the Lord is holding out to us a promise that is ours for the taking. And this is that promise. I will cleanse them of blood guilt, which I have not yet cleansed. Now that's a promise that I believe is ours for the taking. And so I would say to you that what we're going to look at for the next few minutes has bearing on so many things that have already been mentioned in these sessions. First of all, Apostle John has said numerous times we must gain authority over Baal. And if we're going to go out in authority to Freemasonry sites and to Catholic sites and to um, Mormon sites and to Muslim sites, we must have our own house clean. Cindy Jacobs cried out yesterday about the whiteness still of the prayer movement. And uh, after so many attempts to come together, what is it that's, that's not only in the prayer movement, but, but in so many aspects of the church in the United States? Why are we still not being able to come together? Cindy also mentioned something that she prophesied years ago, that Islam is threatening the United States because racism has not been dealt with. And I would suggest to you, well, I would ask you a question. The last time Islam threatened the world, threatened to take over the world, what stopped it? Well, the church thought the Crusades would stop it. But that was a dismal failure. What stopped it was the Reformation. What stopped Islam was when the church got right. And so Mike Jacobs asked the question yesterday, what about Baal and the church? And then Jerry Tuma talked about humanism and the liberal church structures But right now, today, we need to look at the conservative church in the United States. And we need to let God show us where we have pierced him. So let me preface this by saying I was born in Mississippi. I have lived in Mississippi most of my life. Spent four years in Indiana, ten years here in Oklahoma. I love the South. I love the land. I love the people. I was Southern Baptist for 50 years. Most of my family is still Southern Baptist. It was literally, well, some of you know this, it was literally like having to denounce your citizenship to move on with the Lord. The last seven years that I was a Southern Baptist, I worked for the Baptist Convention here in Oklahoma, and I actually directly connected with... um, almost all of the national Southern Baptist entities. And during that seven years, I was appalled and stunned by what the Lord uncovered, by what I saw, by what I experienced. And when I came out, I said, Lord, what was that? I mean, I I know that there's such a thing as Christians being human. I understand that. But I said, Lord, this was very wicked. And I was in a class at Wagner Leadership Institute, and I said, Lord, um, okay, I know that was denominational issues, but that thing was acting like a territorial spirit. And indeed, it was acting like a territorial spirit. And what we're going to talk about in the next few minutes is literally the tip of the iceberg of what the Lord, he had begun to uncover when I left the convention. And after I left, the first thing I think, one of the first things that John Benefield told me as I came here to the OAPN meetings and 
um, talked about what I had seen up to that point, and he said, you know you're going to say this, don't you? So now, John, that was 2005. (laughs) And after all this time of healing, of deepening my love for Christ, of deepening my love for the church, and of going back and looking at the root of what in the world I saw, this is... This is the time that God is first uncovering what he's been revealing. So he's, he's revealing what we have not wanted to see in order that we can become who we truly are. Now I'm going to see if I can actually work this. Yes. Okay, going back to the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. This month, actually, is the 150th anniversary of the first secession. South Carolina led the way. Mississippi was second on Jan- in January, followed in quick secession by Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. Then everything sort of stopped until that first battle of Fort Sumter on April the 12th, 1861, and then four more states seceded, Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina. Now, I've put down for Virginia and Tennessee the date that Secession was declared. In both those states, the voters ratified the secession at a later date. So you may see two different dates for secession for those states. As a result of secession and the beginning of the war, before the war ended, four years later, in April, officially, in April of 1865, there were 381 battles fought on the land. And those battles were fought in 25 states plus the District of Columbia. District of Christ, excuse me. I practiced saying that right, and I still didn't do it. Most of the battles that you'll see were fought in the 11 Confederate states, with Virginia by far having the the most. 123 battles fought in Virginia. The capital of the Confederacy was Richmond. Of course, the capital of the United States was right across the river there, and um, so that became a, a major battleground. There were also a number of battles fought in the two divided states of Kentucky and Missouri. Both of them were slave states, and both had rump governments that declared secession, but officially the states did not secede, and yet they were the sites of 38, the site of 38 battles. And then there were battles in 12 other states, including Colorado, Idaho, Indiana, Kansas, Maryland, Minnesota, New Mexico, North Dakota, Ohio, Oklahoma, which had seven, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. And even the number of battles is a little bit misleading. Pennsylvania only had two battles, but one of them was Gettysburg, which was the costliest battle of the war, more than 51,000 casualties on both sides. By the war's end, the casualty count is somewhere around 620,000. That exceeds our loss of our nation in all the other wars from the revolution through Vietnam. Now, I, I came across this phrase in 1 Samuel, the staggering burden of needless bloodshed. And I thought, this is what the Civil War casualties and the abortion casualties that we're dealing with today, this is what we're looking at, the staggering burden of needless bloodshed. But I also noticed some connection between these two types of bloodshed. The scripture at the bottom of your pa- the page says, Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I will give you over to bloodshed, and it will pursue you. Since you did not hate bloodshed, bloodshed will pursue you. And I would say this is exactly what we're seeing. Now we're going to see, we're going to see a little more about how, it, in fact, of not hating bloodshed, we glorified it. It's interesting, too, that both of these kinds of bloodshed are family against family. 
This is not a foreign attack on the United States. This is the U.S. fighting each other. And we've long thought of it as brother fighting brother. But when you look, particularly from the perspective of the South, this, this war that was created by the southern states seceding was actually parents agreeing together to sacrifice their sons on the altar of needless bloodshed. Parents agreeing together to sacrifice their sons on the altar of needless bloodshed. I already had this made up the other night. In the middle of the night, the Lord woke me up and said that. (laughs) I said, whoa. I would also suggest to you that today the conservative church in the United States has responded to the violence of abortion in the same way that the church in the South, the Christian church in the South, responded to the violence and immorality that preceded the Civil War. And that is that publicly we denounce it, but privately we participate in it or look the other way. I know personally of a pastor of a megachurch in the area where I live. I'm good friends with the leader of a pro-life organization in the region, and she was a member of his church. And when this pastor came to the megachurch to become pastor, he made this big public photo op of giving money, presenting a check to the... um, the organization, the pro-life organization, and stating his support for this organization. Now, when my friend, this is a very affluent pastor of a very affluent church, and when she looked at the check, it was for $25. And then the pastor went to his pulpit and berated his people for giving to any other outside parachurch organizations that all the money is supposed to come to the local church. And my friend believes, and like I said, she's an insider in this church. My friend believes that this man in his personal life is abusive to his wife. So what we have here is a show of support for pro-life, this proclamation that abortion is wrong, but underneath there's all this junk that keeps us from having any authority to actually deal decisively with the issue. So if there's any doubt that dealing with issues still undealt with from the Civil War are pertinent today, this slide right here should deal with it just by itself. But there's a whole lot of other issues. When we ask what led to this, what, how did this all happen, and we go back before the Civil War, how, what started that? Well, of course, the immediate answer is slavery. That's what... People will normally just blurt out. Now, in my neck of the woods in Mississippi, they'll say, oh, no, 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 it was economics. Or, oh, no, 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 it was states' rights. Well, I would submit to you that all of those are different names for the same thing. Because here's what happened. In 1793, the cotton gin was invented, and that was just about the time that the settlers were pouring into the south. They were pouring in past the seaboard states and into the Midwest and the south, but the south particularly had good land, good land for growing cotton. And suddenly, cotton became to these settlers like white gold. Now, you just picture the gold rush in California. Well, this is what was happening in the South. To get land, you wanted lots of land so that you could grow lots of cotton so that you could be very rich. But in order to grow lots of cotton, you had to have lots of slaves because cotton was a very intensive, labor-intensive crop. And so the land and the slaves and the cotton all became the status symbols of wealth. One historian has said, without the South's obsession with cotton, it is hard to imagine that the Civil War would have occurred at all. The people didn't go into the land going, oh, Lord, you have given us this land. It's a beautiful land, and we want to know what you want us to plant here, how to, how to best steward the land, how to best cultivate it, how to best work with the peoples who are already on the land. Oh, no, we want wealth. And so we're in this mad tear that we have to have wealth, and the only way to have wealth is to have cotton, and the only way to have cotton is to have slaves and land, and so we have to fight a war, for heaven's sake. Because cotton became king. 
Now, cotton is a wonderful crop. But anything that becomes king, that becomes all important to us, will have a rotten root. And so if you look at the cotton plant, the, most, the thing that most stands out to you, of course, is the cotton bowl. And slavery is like the cotton bowl on the cotton plant. It's the thing that when we look at what's, what led to the Civil War, that's the thing we always look at. But it is not the whole story. It's a big thing and it's a visible thing and it's very real and we need to deal with it. But it is the presenting issue. And behind the presenting issue, or in addition to the presenting issue, are some other issues. And it's interesting to me as I begin to look at these other issues, they all seem to be summed up in the word justice issues. If you look at the whole plant, you've got this whole plant full of injustice. All kinds of injustice issues. You've got the Indian removal, which we're going to talk about more in the next slide. That began in 1830 and continued until 1858. Do you notice this, the context of the date of the Civil War? Indian removal ends in 1858, the Civil War, the secession starts in 1860, and the war begins in 1861. The view and treatment of women is, is another thing that's just not been looked at in the context of the Civil War, but it played a huge role in the war. The women were at the same time put down and at the same time put up on a pedestal so that they were treated as inferior and treated really as... I have some wonderful quotes from Mary Chestnut's Civil War that talks about the, well, the Negro slaves and the other slaves, which are the women and children of the masters. And yet, at the same time, the women were put on a pedestal, and so when the men decided to go to war, they said, they said that they were doing it to protect the honor of the southern woman. Now, these were the same men who, at night, would slip over into the slave quarters and abuse and rape the slave women, although it wasn't called rape. It legally was not rape. And then they would have children that they disowned because they were slave children. And, they, and the wives would go around pretending. Now, there's another quote in her book that says, very interesting how everybody notices how everybody else's children look like the master. <laughs> but the wife just pretends that this isn't happening in her house. And then the men go to war and say, we've got to fight this war for the virtue of our women. We got to protect them. And so in protecting the women, what did they do? They raped the land. They raped the women. They took their sons and killed them. And the women said, okay, whatever you say. So the women agreed to it too. The crux of the matter here is an intent to recreate the ancient Greek and Roman cultures. There's a book that is, has been very helpful in... Uh, in this research, there are a number of books, but the one I'm focusing on most in this presentation is called Baptized in Blood by Charles Reagan Wilson. Um, and this is a quote. The cult of chivalry developed focusing on manners, women, military affairs, military affairs, so that the idea of war became fun. The ideal of the Greek democracy and Roman romantic oratory. You know, my hometown in Mississippi is named Corinth. Now, that's a biblical name, but no biblical scholar would ever name their town <laughs> Corinth. I mean, that's not the church that had the greatest reputation in the Bible, right? It was because of the Greek origin that Corinth was named that. And also, it's the scene of two Civil War battles. And right next to a third, which was one of the largest... So after the war, this attempt to recreate this Greek and Roman culture didn't die down or go away. The people didn't repent and go, boy, that was a bad idea. That didn't go so well. They, said they embraced it even more. And after, immediately after the war was Reconstruction, so the people were under, uh, they were not allowed to do a lot of things. But as soon as Reconstruction ended, which was about the mid-1870s, then they began to do some things that they had been wanting to do all along. And so they began building and dedicating statues and monuments to the Civil War, to the Confederacy. 
The first statue of Stonewall Jackson was dedicated in Richmond on October 26, 1875, and the oration or preaching was done by a Presbyterian pastor, Moses Hogue. This, um, Wilson, the writer of Baptized in Blood, says that this was the beginning of a frenzy of monument making which stretched for decades. And so, he's, and he, so he says this represented a beginning of a movement that lasted for generations. And I want you to see what the beginning was as you look at that quote. We lay the cornerstone of a new pantheon in commemoration of our country, and he does not mean the U.S., and the, and the commemoration of our country, the Confederacy's fame. Now, the Pantheon in Rome is a temple to all the gods of ancient Rome. So what he's saying here is this is the first, this is the cornerstone of a whole slew of monuments that we're going to build across the land, altars erected to glorify needless bloodshed. Now, I hope you can see those maps well enough to get the picture. And um, the map of the Civil War battles shows the different colors of the battles only mean which uh, they're ge geographical. The colors don't mean anything except blues farther west and reds farther east, okay? That doesn't mean the intensity of the battle or anything like that. But you can see that the battles were mostly concentrated in the south which were the slave states. Uh, but also, you might notice that the similarity of the battle sites to the lands that the Native Americans were required to leave and went across on their way to the new location in Kansas and Oklahoma. You see, in 1830, when... Andrew Jackson signed into law the Indian Removal Act, which supposedly the Indians had a choice of whether they removed, but in reality they did not. And there was tens of thousands of lives lost through the various relocations, as well as all kinds of atrocities and, and terrible things that happened. And so here, here is needless bloodshed, which led to needless bloodshed, which led to more needless bloodshed. Even on this, on this map, the battles that took place in weird places like Indiana and, and uh, here, I mean, um, Idaho and over here in Oklahoma, most of them were related to the Indians because in many cases the Indian tribes sided with the Confederacy because of the way they had been treated by the United States. Since you did not hate bloodshed, bloodshed will pursue you. Now, it's interesting to me, we're going to talk in a minute here about the Second Great Awakening. And the Second Great Awakening began to die in the year that the Indian Removal Act was signed. It went for 40 years and then began to die in the year that, Renewal Act, that Removal Act was signed. But it was also a time that something was happening in the minds of the Southerners re with regard to slavery. Okay, now we've looked above ground. Above ground, there's all kinds of, with this rotten King Cotton, <laughs> we, we've seen that slavery was the presenting issue. We've seen that there's all these other justice issues that were going on. But underneath this, if, if outside is justice issues, underneath are righteousness issues. And so here's the root system. I actually found a picture of cotton root rot. And there you have it. Now, if you look at these sins, sin attitudes, you'll, you'll notice that they're common to all people. But I would say to you, I have read numerous books. I have much, much um, background and quotes and pages of information that shows that these particular sins are the sin strongholds of the region. Greed being the underlying stronghold... We've already mentioned that. Uh, 
Oh, I've got a couple of quotes here. We think about the South as laid back, you know, everybody's sitting on their front porch, sipping mint julep or whatever while the slaves work in the cotton fields. Okay, here's, here's a picture of Mississippi, Vicksburg in the South in 1836. A man named James Davidson said, the people here are run mad with speculation. They did business in a kind of frenzy. The city itself was full of strangers. In fact, the South is crowded with strangers, gentlemen adventurers who have dreamed golden dreams of the South and who think they have nothing more to do than come South and be the lord of a cotton plantation and a hundred slaves. The truth is, a British traveler concluded after touring the South, this passion for the acquisition of money is much stronger and more universal in this country than in any other under the sun, at least that I have visited. So the South was pursuing that greed and power. There's a quote that I forgot to bring, but it was written in the Alabama Baptist paper in the midst of the... uh, question about slavery and after slavery was was gone how were things going to work out and the Alabama Baptist paper said the whites mean to rule and rule they will so there was a, a oppressive power stronghold that was going on there was a pride stronghold we are the best region we do things right we are the most christian we are the most gentlemanly we are the most honorable and everybody else needs to come to us to know how to live life and do christianity clinging to this three-part main root tap root there were other things i've already mentioned the immorality and violence that against the slaves, against Indian women, and immorality and violence, there's not a way to untangle those. They go hand in hand. Where there's one, there's the other. There's also the, the root of fear that became deeply, 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 deeply ingrained in the people. Fear of each other, white fear of black, black fear of white, everybody fear of everybody else, anybody fear of anybody saying anything that didn't fit with what everybody had agreed was okay to say. There was then division and rejection and rebellion that came out of that. And the whole thing was covered with this deception, this veil that says we are a society of honor and virtue. So where was the church in all of this? Well, first of all, the church was awakening. About the same time as the cotton gin was created, the second great awakening started. And it's it's swept through the south it swept through the nation but particularly through the south as the south was being settled and the people in the awakening and i don't want you to think about them at you know the methodists and the baptists and the presbyterians as them because the methodists and the presbyterians and the baptists were the evangelical slash charismatics that i mean that's who there who was there except for the episcopals who sort of sat back like this <laughs> and bunny i'll appreciate that but um <laughs> but but those three groups were all together in this awakening. I mean, all in the same tent, the different pastors from the different denominations preaching. And one man said, no matter what the flavor of the preaching, that the manifestations of the Holy Spirit were just happening. No matter how the guy preached or what, you know, the people were falling out. They were getting saved. They were literally, truly changing their lives. I mean, the Lord was moving and sweeping across this whole area of the country. And people not only went to the meetings and got saved and their lives changed, but then they flocked into the churches and maintained that commitment to pursue the Lord. But then they hit up against those injustices and those unrighteousnesses that were a part of the culture. And then they had a big decision to make. Were they going to go along with the culture or were they going to go with the Holy Spirit? And so for years, there was this mega struggle, inside struggle of the Christians. It's in their letters, it's in their correspondence, it's in their diaries, where they see the wrongs of slavery and they see the wrongs of what was done to the Indians and they see the wrongs of how women are treated or whatever. They, they see the wrong and they, and they struggle with this, this. Can I, should I, how can we be doing this it, it, can it, can we still be saved can how how do we deal with this in a culture where it's already here what what do we do about it and so they finally decided well maybe what we should do about it is not call it injustice 
let's just say, this isn't evil. This is God's plan. This is how God intended it to be. See the scripture? Look at all the scriptures about slavery. I have a, I have a little um, exercise for you. If you have concerns about what the scripture says about women, and you know how, what, what does the Bible really teach? Well, I want you to get, get that same framework of mind and go look up slavery. There is a whole lot more biblical excuse for slavery than for the role of women in the church. It's only by the Holy Spirit that we recognize, you know what? That is wrong. And I'm not sure what this scripture means about, you know, why Jesus didn't say that's wrong, just don't have slaves. I mean, I don't, I don't know why he didn't say that, but I know by the Holy Spirit and by the other things that the scripture teaches that it's wrong. So instead of going with the Holy Spirit, the church decided to go with the culture. And it wasn't an immediate thing. And it was, you know, people will say, well, you know, when you're in a culture, you just can't see. You know, you're, you're right in the culture. You can't see it. That is not true. They had, they had the awakening of the Holy Spirit of God, and they knew. And they chose repeatedly over time, repeatedly, 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 individually, collectively, they chose to ignore the Holy Spirit. So after those years of struggle, there came that time when there was a shifting and a turning and when they began to say it's it's okay to do these wrongs they're not really wrongs we are a culture of honor we are a culture of virtue and and we just call it virtue and that makes it so and so they they chose to try to align with christ for salvation and personal virtue which was their definition of virtue and at the same time to align and defend with the strongholds the unrighteous root system of the south I think Jesus said we can't serve two masters. But the church said, yeah, you can. And so, 1830, the Second Great Awakening is still going on. By 1845, 15 years later, both of the major denominations have split north against south on racial lines. Now, I say north against south. The south pulled out from the whole, creating North and South. The Southern Baptists uh, have continued with that Southern convention ever since that date. They refused. The other denominations, after the Civil War, at some point went back together. The Southern denomination never did. And in fact, they considered it, they considered the Northern Baptists the enemy, along with a lot of other people. <clears throat> We went to pray at the site of the founding of the Southern Baptist Convention a couple of summers ago, and um, it was First Baptist Church, Augusta, Georgia, and the church isn't there. I mean, the First Baptist Church is at a different building site now, but we went to the original site, and we pulled up. There is a Baptist church there. It's on a boulevard in old Augusta. There's big trees out in the boulevard, and we saw a pulpit standing in the middle of the boulevard, a stone pulpit, and... We went up to the pulpit, got out of the car, went up to the pulpit, and pulpit, stone pulpit, stone Bible, free masonry. Pulpit in front of the church, facing the doors on the same land that says this is where the Southern Baptist Convention was started in 1845. So here's the church. Oh, I didn't come there. You have that on your paper. There's the church, awakening, struggling with the conviction of the Holy Spirit, quenching the Spirit, refusing reformation. This is one thing that Dutch Sheets is teaching now, that we have a, double, a dual assignment. It's awakening and reformation. And so what the church in the South did is receive awakening and refuse reformation. And you know when you do that, the awakening goes away too. So the church led the way in seceding. And they thought they did it pretty successfully. So when... Lincoln was elected president, and it looked like they weren't going to get to keep their slaves. The church actually encouraged the governments of the states to secede. And then the Civil War began. And on, in May 1861, after the war began April 12th, the Southern Baptist Convention met in Savannah, Georgia. 
and passed a 10-point resolution. You have a link to the whole resolution. It's very lengthy, but I, quote, I quoted a couple of the primary parts. The convention resolved, and they said, we must speak out. We must make clear our intentions, and this is what they said, that we must cordially approve the formation of the government of the Confederate States of America and admire and applaud the noble course of the government up to the present time that we most cordially tender to the President of the Confederate States, to his cabinet, and to the members of the Congress now convened at Montgomery, the assurances of our sympathy and entire confidence. With them are our hearts and our hearty cooperation. Then in 1863, the convention met again, this time back in Augusta at the same place where I told you that Freemasonry pulpit stands. And they made a new resolution, this one even stronger, that the events of the past two years have only confirmed the conviction expressed by this convention at its last session that the war which has been forced upon us is on our part just and necessary and have only strengthened our opposition to a reunion with the United States on any terms whatever. And while deploring the dreadful evils of the war and earnestly desiring peace, we have no thought of ever yielding, but will render a hearty support to the Confederate government in all constitutional measures to secure our independence. This is the church covenanting with a government. a covenant-breaking government, and they broke covenant with the church itself. They've already, 15 years earlier, 16, broken covenant with, with the body of Christ in order to create their own convention, and now they're making covenant with a covenant-breaking government. And they're not only making the covenant, but two years later they're strengthening and declaring it never-ending. And to my knowledge, and I look through all the resolutions of all the years, they never did recant from this. Now, the Southern Baptist Convention today, you would say, well, it's a national convention. Well, it, has the, it gives the impression of being a national convention, but it's really still a Southern Convention. I told you we live four years in Indiana. The churches in Indiana, like the churches outside of the Deep South are called, um, oh, what's the word? Lord? They're called, um, well, I guess I'm not supposed to tell you what they're called. But they're, they're looked on as needing help from the South. And so the, 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 they're looked on as missions, okay? And so anything outside of the Deep South is pioneer missions. That's it. They're pioneer missions. In Indiana, you didn't know that you were pioneer missions, did you? And so, so they're, they're very small, and they're little center, centers of Southern culture. Now, now, you know there's always exceptions, okay? But I'm telling you, for the most part, the churches in the other parts of the country are where Southerners came, and they moved, and they said, hmm, there's not a Southern Baptist church here, and I'm not going to join that Northern Baptist church. And you know all those other denominations, they're not really churches. And so we better plan us a church. And, and so they did, and they kept it this little enclave of Southern culture. I am not, guys, I am not exaggerating. This is real. And so then, in 1980-something, when the, when the Saturday Evening Post wrote about the Southern Convention and, complained, and said how glorious it was, it actually was talking about a convention that was very, very strong in the South and very, very weak in the rest of the nation. And in fact, in order for the churches and the conventions in the rest of the nations to exist, the churches in the South give to the home mission board, and then that money goes to the other conventions to keep them going. So all their officers get paid from the churches in the South that keep them going. So we've got an image of a national convention when really we've still got the Southern Baptist Convention. See what happens when you covenant with a dead government? In 1865, Lee surrendered on April the 9th. Here's a quote from Baptized in Blood. A recurring phrase in the Confederate religious lexicon was baptism of blood. This evocative, powerful terminology suggested the role of war in bringing a redemption from past sins, an atonement, and a sanctification for the future. Now, whose role are all of those things supposed to be? Now, 
Now, the South did confess a lot of sins. I'm going to tell you, through the whole Civil War, they fasted. They fasted so many times. I mean, after the Civil War, they quit fasting because they were just fed up with God because they had fasted and fasted, and he had not answered. But they fasted and confessed card playing and drinking and dancing. And besides that, they confessed the sins of the Yankees for attacking them and not leaving them alone when all they wanted to do was take their toys and go home. They still did not acknowledge slavery as evil. They still did not admit to the other injustices they'd agreed with. They still did not admit to the underlying strongholds that had led to needless war and the loss of more than 600,000 lives. And in 1866, a man named Edward Pollard in Richmond wrote a book called The Lost Cause when he called for a war of ideas to retain the Southern identity. That whole root system that we just saw, that whole injustice thing above ground and and unrighteousness below ground, he said, we've got to hold on to this because this is virtue. And all the pastors said, yes and amen. Now, that's... I want to say something here. God knows how many righteous pastors and righteous believers cried out to him during all this time. God knows their names. He heard their cries. He saw their tears. He counted it to them as righteousness. But the church collectively chose to do evil. The Lost Cause ritual celebrated a mythology which focused on the Confederacy. According to the mythmakers, a pantheon of southern heroes portrayed as the highest products of the Old South civilization had emerged during the Civil War to battle the forces of evil as symbolized by the Yankee. Okay, I have to tell you this. I went home to visit my mom before we moved back, and she was watching a church on TV in the area, and I'm not going to say the name, and the pastor said, he was preaching on John 3.16, Baptist pastor, he was preaching on John 3.16, and he said, God loves everybody, and he's naming this, and he's naming that, and he's naming this, and he said, God even loves the Yankees. I said, oh my word, what year is this? Did I suddenly go back in history? I mean, I promise you, he said that he was not joking. The myth enacted the Christian story of Christ's suffering and death with the Confederacy at the sacred center. In the southern myth, the Christian drama of suffering and salvation was incomplete. The Confederacy lost a holy war, and there was no resurrection. But what was the battle cry? What was the rallying cry? The South will rise again! Do you see the heresy? It did not. In a land devastated by war, brutalized by Reconstruction and the power struggles afterward, where economies did not rally and dead sons did not come marching home again, the connection made between the dead Confederacy and Christ had deep and lasting implications. When the South didn't rise again, the church began acting like Christ hadn't either. The church became content to live like the disciples in the Gospels. See, they'd already said no to the Holy Spirit, so they didn't have the Holy Spirit power. And now they just contented themselves with, well, see, this is what it's like. You just fight a holy war and you just die, and then you wait till Christ comes again. So they became content to live like the disciples in the Gospels rather than the disciples in Acts. And they began looking forward to things only always getting worse. That's where the dispensational teaching came. That's the root of it. Things are always only going to get worse. We are the Laodicean church. Thank God the Chinese haven't heard that. Uh, (laughs) Yes. Okay. Okay. When the South, this part, when the South didn't rise again, the church began acting like Christ didn't either. 
The church became content to live like the disciples in the Gospels. I mean, think about how the disciples, they loved Christ. They wanted to please him, but they didn't get it. They didn't have power. They didn't have understanding. They didn't have consistency. You know, sometimes they do something really wonderful, and then they did something really terrible right in the next minute. And, you know, that's the church. And, and instead of the church in, the, in Acts, which had the power of the Holy Spirit and the wisdom of the Spirit and the movement in the, into the world and the ability to, um, to see miracles and everything that God wanted to do, so they became content to live like the disciples in the Gospels, and then they began to look forward to things only getting worse. If you will, if you will look up Schofield, the man who wrote the Schofield Reference Bible, which I was raised with, if you will look him up, he apparently was a scoundrel, and he also served a year in the Confederate Army, and so did, but the man who, he, he actually took the teachings of a man who was actually apparently a very sincere pastor in Missouri, but this man also had Confederate connections. So that whole teaching that, well, this is just the lukewarm church, and we're in the last days, and and, you know, we've already had the rest of the church history and everything's just only going to get worse till Jesus comes again. That is all a part of, that came out of, that whole thinking that connected the Confederacy and Christ. So let's look again at that term, baptism of blood. Um, some more quotes here. Clergymen compared the sacrificial redemptive deaths of the Confederates to the passion of Christ. Now, notice it's only the Confederates, not the Yankees, no. The communal aspect was crucial. The shedding of blood cleansed all of Southern society as well as its individual soldiers. And then this pastor who wrote a novel, White Blood, likened the fate of the South near the war's end to the blessed Savior who passed from gloomy Gethsemane to the judgment hall through fearful ordeal of being forsaken by his friends and then on to the bloody cross. So there you have it again. This is not just a one-time thing, and it's not just one denomination. It's all the denominations, including the Catholics, but it's all the Protestant denominations, including the Episcopals and the Presbyterians and the Methodists and the Baptists. So... Here's, I don't think this is on your sheet. Well, it may be on your sheet, but it's not on up here. The Southern Church used the term baptism of blood in such a way as to bind themselves to the Confederate war effort by a covenant act. They entered a blood covenant. that they actually compared to the covenant with Christ. In El Dorado, Arkansas, is Ruby here somewhere? In El Dorado, Arkansas, they erected a marble drinking fountain to the Confederacy. Its publicity statement said, and this is what Wilson says, in a phrase culled from countless hymns and sermons on the sacrificial Jesus, that the water in that fountain symbolized, quote, the loving stream of blood shed by the southern drinkers, southern soldiers. So drinkers from the fount were thus symbolically baptized in Confederate blood. Now, the North had a different version of the same thing. They also used the term baptism of blood, and I have not researched all the implications of that, but here's one quote from a soldier who's um, a Northern soldier, Union soldier, whose brother was killed at Vicksburg. He said, this is quoting from the North point of view, but the blood of our fallen heroes will purify and place an indelible stamp of true patriotism upon this cursed soil. So that's another, I mean, that's the blood of the Yankees isn't, Christ's blood either, okay? Uh, but the South in particular made an a effort year after year after year to uh, equate the blood of the Confederates with the blood of Christ. Another quote from Baptized in Blood. In a word, says Samuel L. S. Hill, a leading historian of Southern religion, many Southern whites have regarded their society as God's most favored. To a greater degree than any other, theirs approximates the ideals the Almighty has in mind for mankind everywhere. This attitude helped wed Southern churches to Southern culture. And this is why I, what I saw in the church in this century, in this decade, looked like a territorial spirit. 
Because it was. Because the church had made covenant with a territorial spirit way back then, and it's never been annulled. They said, we will never yield. After the Civil War, a South stripped of slavery took measures to reestablish. They, they were going to recreate the Cotton Bowl any way they could. And so in a society where status and character were tied to mastery, they became openly involved with Freemasonry, openly and widely involved. The Ku Klux Klan was born. Strict se segregation was implemented. Jim Crow laws were enacted that actually overturned the laws that gave the blacks and black men, women, we didn't get it yet, but gave black men um, new rights. And in the midst of all of this, the church referred to the region as our Southern Zion, or more specifically, our Baptist Zion. There's a website today, if you Google our, our Baptist Zion, I think you'll find an interesting website. So by unholy covenants, the church bound itself to everything in the culture, including and especially the great evils that it would not see or confess. Okay, now I want to stop here and say there are many good aspects of Southern culture. <laughs> but it's sort of like when somebody goes in and they have cancer. You know, the doctor doesn't say, wow, you have great heart, you have great lungs, you are, you know, you are looking fit in so many ways. The doctor says, you know what, we've got to get this out. <laughs> So that's what, we're focusing on the cancer today, okay? Um, and that cancer is held in place by those covenants with death. What Isaiah 28 calls covenants with death. You boast, we have entered into a covenant with death. With the realm of the dead, we have made an agreement. When an overwhelming scourge sweeps by, it cannot touch us, for we have made a lie our refuge and falsehood our hiding place. So this is what the Sovereign Lord says. See, I lay in Zion a, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. Hail will sweep away your refuge, the lie, and water will overflow your hiding place. Your covenant with death will be annulled. Your agreement with the realm of the dead will not stand. Now, if you keep on reading in there, you see it's like, this sounds like it's a terrible thing. And I will say this, it is a terrible thing if you continue to cling to the covenant with death. When the covenant is swept away, you will be too. But if you will release that covenant and cling to Jesus Christ, that tested cornerstone, then you're going to stay firm when the other thing goes away. So that little quote up top just keeps haunting me. Can a cause be lost which is passed through such a baptism as ours? The Confederacy is long dead. But a culture, and especially a church culture, that glorify, glorifies bloodshed and commits itself to unholy covenants will remain bound to a corpse. And... As one man wrote um, about 20 years after the Civil War, a man wrote a, a groundbreaking book on blood covenant. I forgot his name. I've got it here somewhere. But anyway, he said that when we enter into covenant, especially blood covenant, we enter commingles natures. Yes, Trumbull. It, um, intercommingling of natures, the blood covenant. And so th what we've done is we've intercommingled the nature of the church with the, na with the nature of that evil root that we looked at earlier. So what does that have to do with us? Well, could we say that the conservative U.S. church culture is heavily influenced by the Bible Belt? Could we say that a lot of the publishing related to the conservative U.S. church culture comes out of the Bible Belt? Could we say that a lot of people who, whose ancestors or who themselves grew up in the, event, the churches, the denominations we were talking about here in the South, either now or in past years, have now moved to other parts of the country, have now moved into other segments of the church, 
and, and maybe they, they didn't like some of the things they saw in the culture they stepped out of. I mean, some of those wrong things, some of those evil roots, but they didn't recognize all of them. And so they took them, and they didn't know to get rid of them, and they didn't recognize that covenant that's holding it all in place. And so, so it, we've sort of taken it with us wherever we've gone. So let's see if we've taken it with us. Well, in the U.S. conservative church culture today, in addition to the abortion issue, which we talked about earlier, in the church culture, do we see double-mindedness, a belief that we can serve two masters? I'll tell you how I saw this. In the Southern Baptist Convention, I was ordered to serve the convention above Christ. I was ordered to do that. In what way? Okay, um, I was working with women because, you know, that's what women can do. We can work with women and children. (laughs) And so um, I was leading the women to follow Christ fully. To There are two organizations in Southern Baptist for women, and one is the WMU, which is missions, and the other is women's ministry, which is Bible study. And so instead of everybody recognizing that we all need to be growing in Christ and to be on mission with him, there's this big war because there's these two organizations fighting against each other. And they brought me in and said, can you fix this? <laughs> and so I just began to lead the women to follow Christ. You come together, you ask him what he wants you to do, you do what he says. That sounds simple. And so they began to do it somewhat. Now, we're, again, we're held in place by this, this ugly stuff that we haven't recognized is there. So we can't go as far as the Lord would like us to go, but we're moving toward hearing from the Lord, doing what he says. But as we're doing that, you know, the Lord is creating a new wineskin. So he's showing the women new ways to do. They are being involved in the mission of God in the world. They are being involved in Bible study, but the oldest organization was the missions organization. And so the Lord is not necessarily telling people to organize with this particular name of an organization and this particular structure. And, you know, I, He's just, he's leading them into a new wineskin for how do we make this all work together? Well, the leaders of that particular women's organization became furious and decided um, that I was public enemy number one because I was the reason that the organization had been losing members for 30 years. I am. Yeah, for following the Holy Spirit. So at first, the leaders of the state convention told me, well, those women just have to, we, we've told you to do this. You're doing a great job. We're behind you. What they really meant was we're way behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Remember what I said about the men protecting the women? It did not happen. In fact, they invited those women in and, and let them stir up and foment what they knew to be lies. And they let me be brutalized over and over again, over a period of months. And they let my reputation be torn to pieces. And they knew that those women were not telling the truth, but greed was in there. Because you see, those women said, we are connected with a lot of women who give money to the cooperative program. And if you don't get rid of her, our women will stop giving to your offering. So, thank you. Thank you. So I came, as I said, I came to this church within a month after leaving the convention. And um, the OAPN group on Tuesdays, the ladies that were there, some of you were out there. Some of you are out there still. Yes, there you are, you sweet ladies. I saw ladies be sweet to me and love me back to health. And I saw women who truly loved the Lord and were following him with all their heart and not just pretending to and then doing evil things behind, you know, under the guise of virtue and honor. So thank you. So there's that double-mindedness. Along with deception and confession, you know, it's so easy for us, even when we do identificational repentance and we're like confessing the sins of our nation, in our mind, it's very easy for that to be, mean their sins. 
Just like the South was confessing the sins of the Yankees, you know, and they were confessing the little piddly things that, you know, they were willing to deal with. But it's just very easy for us as we're to be deceived into not dealing with the really deep-rooted stuff that needs to get out of us. The fear... um, you know what? I'm, I'm concerned about some of our prayer requests because they're very fear-motivated. They're, we're, they're motivating us to act out of a fear of loss rather than love for Christ and his kingdom. Elaborate? Well, even, you know, I love the way that Susan presented the Muslim issue because it came back to, you know what, this, th- these things are huge and but god is bigger and we are to love that's how we you know remember the reformation was what did away with we got to get our act together um so but a lot of times when i see urgent written really big at the top of a prayer request i um, delete it (laughs) because it doesn't mean needs happening it's happening now it means this is going to create huge fear in you (laughs) you see what i'm saying it's because we we react on the basis and okay Let me say something. Fox News is not going to save us. And Fox News is cultivating a law of fear. So, is that a good example? Okay. (laughs) So, um, other strongholds, we've talked about the division, even in the the, um, prayer movement. Um, violence. As I looked at the history of violence in the South and in this culture, it's equally the violence like of lynching and rape and all that and the violence of false accusation and words. And that was the violence that I experienced personally uh, and came to find out there, there's a lot of word violence that's very cruel. Power struggles. You don't have any of that in your, in your church, in your area, do you? Rejection. Oh, let me say this about the South. The South, the church in the North was crying out for the church in the South to recognize slavery as a sin. Okay, so they were, they were actually confronting them with their sin. Well, the South took that, the church in the South took that as a rejection of them. You're rejecting us. Okay, and so they in turn created a culture of rejection. So our, tr- our current church culture is by and large a culture of rejection you reject somebody else before they reject you or i mean you just think about that think about it in your own family think about it in your church um another thing that i'm asking do you see is impotence to challenge and change the culture if we've got that root that's on page two if we've got all that stuff in our root if we got immorality and violence in our root how can we deal with homosexuality and abortion if we got division in our root, how can we bring the nation together? Yes. Just a second, maybe yes. uh, before she goes on with this. You know, one of the reasons that, uh, uh, what you said about Susan yesterday, one of the reasons I asked her to come rather than other people is exactly what you said, and I didn't realize it until you just said it, that Many times we hear people describe about the problem of Islam and the fear of taking over and all that kind of stuff. And they're very accurate descriptions, but they do not give any out. It only produces fear. It's hopeless. They're going to take us over. Let's just give up. You know, they may not say let's give up, but it's always presented in such a way that it's hopeless. They're growing so fast. There's nothing really. We, the implication is there's nothing we can do about it. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever, ever felt that way with some presentations? And I'm not trying to say that they, they necessarily mean to do it that way, that they're consciously doing it that way, but I heard somebody at uh, the Oak Initiative, for example, and I, it was a great organization, this man that was a former Muslim that got born again, and he was talking to us, and his description about Islam was very accurate, very, very informative, very real, but it, but I, all through the, his presentation, I kept having to fight the fear, spirit of fear. Oh gosh, this sounds really terrible, and it just left us hanging. Well, it's really bad. So, and you're right about Fox News. 
And it's not a sin to watch Fox News, Fox News but, you, but you, if you have any, if, if you allow the wrong kind of fear in your life, I'm talking about anything other than the fear of the Lord, it is idolatry. You have made a God out of that thing that you fear. You're saying it's bigger than God himself and that God can't take care of you and God can't deliver our nation. I'm saying this to all of us because any of us can fall into that trap. I'm sure I have at times in different ways. You can't do that. That's a sin. That is literally saying you, there's a God bigger than our God if you see a problem in your individual life or in society as a whole that you think is just impossible. It's just too hard. You know, I, I appreciate what Jerry Tuma did yesterday because he didn't leave us without any hope, did he? Mm -hmm. But a lot of people who talk about economics, they just show you how bad the problem is. And, oh, boy. I mean, even Jesus himself can't even they don't say it, but even Jesus himself can't. You know, it's just like the Father turns to Jesus. Like, I don't know what we're going to do about this, son. Mm -hmm. You have to fight that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you will fall into the same trap, and you will become useless for the body of Christ. So I just want to piggyback on what she just said. I hadn't really thought about it in exactly that way. But we have begotten... I just want to repent of idolatry right here and right now. Mm -hmm. Father, we repent before you of the sin of idolatry, of fearing things other than you. You said plainly in your word, you will not fear mm -hmm. the people. You will not fear the gods of the people yeah. of the land you're going to take over. You will not fear them. Lord, forgive mm -hmm. us, your people for giving in to fear in any way of any kind. Forgive us for ever thinking that a situation is hopeless or it's too big and too bad for you to take care of. Forgive us for doing exactly what the ten spies did when they went mm -hmm. into the land. They yeah. said, it's a land of milk and honey, but the people are giants and we can't do anything yeah. about it. Help us to be just like Caleb and Joshua, yes. Lord, every day of our lives, to have that spirit of courage and boldness fearlessness and never turn back Thank in the name Lord. of Jesus. Thank Jesus you. Go ahead. Okay. Another, another question is, do you see anywhere in our church culture a fatalistic view of the future? <laughs> Goes right along. Or the Holy Spirit quenched and graved? Um, I do have a this too, uh, you know, I run the risk of being misunderstood, but before I came in here, I just sent away all the perverting spirits that would that would make it sound to you like I said, don't ever watch Fox News or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, I like some country music songs, but I thought when I saw the country music Christmas special the other night that I was seeing a perfect example of double-mindedness. Because, you know, on the one hand, you're going, well, great, they're singing actual Christmas songs about Jesus. But on the other hand, you think, yeah, and on the rest, the other 364 days of the year, if you get the lyrics out of their songs, <laughs> you know, it's like, that doesn't match so much with a life that glorifies Jesus. You see what, you see what I'm saying? There's, and, and see, oh, that's another thing. In this book, Where's Tennessee? Um, it talks about, in the Baptism in Blood book, it talks about the Ryman Auditorium dedication by the Confederacy. And so that double-mindedness, you can see it all through country music. You know, where they'll have a sweet, tender, I believe in God song, and then a honky-tonk, I'm, you know, living it up, and, you know, all the, all the bad things that, the immorality and violence things um, are glorified. Okay. So let me just leave you hopeless. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> what should we do? Um, well, let me start first with if your heritage slash location is not white southern. First of all, we need you. If you're a different race from white, we need you. If you are from the north or any other part of the country, we need you. If your background was not in conservative church culture or a denomination, we need you. We need to repent to you. Because we have thought everybody's against us and we're best. And so, the, I mean, literally, it goes to other denominations. In the whole, the whole charismatic church, we need to apologize to. Because the, the church that said no to the Holy Spirit has attacked and attacked and attacked the charismatic church. And many of you have been hurt by that. And that 
um, oh, before I go to the next one, but we also need to receive from you. Because as I said, the, the idea of the South, and again, there's so much more, but this, that, that white Southerners are like God's gift to the world, which everybody is God's gift to the world, okay? Every people, every culture is God's gift of something to the world, but that got perverted. And so it's like we're, we only are the ones who can save the world, and we only are the ones who have the right interpretation of Scripture. And, and instead of receiving from other cultures and humbling ourselves, we need to humble ourselves and learn from the Asian church and the Hispanic church and the church in the north and, and anybody who will teach us. We need you. But also, if you or your ancestors anywhere along the line have been hurt by this root rot, the unrighteousness, the injustice, the bloodshed, the unholy covenants, and that's, that's huge. Lord. Uh, everybody, I mean, so many people have the, the black Americans, the Native Americans, the Yankees, the members of northern churches who sincerely were trying to get the southern people to see that this was wrong, the women, Jews, all foreigners, uh, Anyone whose ancestors fought in or lived through the Civil War, anyone who lives in or has roots in the South has been hurt. If you're in a structure like this, you're hurt by it. Not only the people that are outside getting pummeled, but the people that are inside. Um, Anyone who has been part of a church culture that has deliberately or unwittingly capitulated to this two-headed allegiance, including church leaders and Christians sincerely wanting to follow Christ alone, if you've been hurt, you need to grieve and you need to forgive. Now, we could do a whole session on grief, but the South refused to grieve. And that ungrieved grief is still stored in there. And it's, it's not pretty. It's like when we went into my mother's cupboard and found this can of tomato sauce that had been left there for years and years and had burst open and spouted black stuff all over the cabinet. That junk has been in there. It's ungrieved grief cuts you off from healing, and bitterness opens you to become what you hate. So, for example, in the South, under the slave culture, the slave men were forced away from their families. The, and, and the white men were, were raping and committing immoral acts with the black women, and the, and the men were sold away from their families. They weren't allowed to be with them. But this was all done in, in secret. Okay, so now we look at the black families that are fa fatherless, and it's like, well, it's continuing patterns that were set under that slave culture. But we also see that immorality. It's like they're doing in the open what the white men did in secret. See, it's like, you, well, let's just do away with that deceit and appearance stuff. Let's just, you know, do in the open. You see, so you look, you become bitter. What you look at, you become bitter about, you find yourself doing. The Ku Klux Klan in the early days, the... Um, Gangs in our day, we terrorize by violence, you see? So if, if you aren't white Southern and you've been hurt and, and you or your ancestors have become bitter, then you probably see some of these same root issues in yourself even though you weren't a part of that culture and in fact detest the things that are in that. So... Let me suggest a couple of things. Um, okay. All I'm right. going to do these things. We can't leave here today without doing without okay. this. Okay, thank you. Thank okay. you. Go ahead. Um, let me point you to Zechariah 12 and 13 and 14. This is what I mentioned at the first of the session uh, where God says, and he's talking about the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, but again, we're asking him, for mercy here. I will pour out a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. The first key is that spirit of grace and supplication poured out, and I believe God's saying that now's the time, that what we haven't been able to see, what we haven't wanted to see, what we've refused to see, that has held us in this bondage, that he is going to show us, just like a, in one day he's going to show the Jews in an even grander scale, but he's going to show us. And wherever we see that spirit of grace and supplication being poured out, that's where we multiply what we're doing here today. 
Wherever we see people willing to see what God is showing us in our church culture about how we've let Baal, because that's what it is. When we're worshiping another, when we let another God come in, we're worshiping Baal beside the altar of the Lord. In fact, when, when I first started having all that struggle that I told you about at the Baptist building, um, the Lord took me to a scripture. Now, I, I didn't know, even know hardly that the apostolic church existed. I had a friend had given me a book by church, Chuck Pierce, and I was like, wow, there's people out here who... I, the Lord had shown me just a few things. I was like... And I wanted to know more, so I began reading. I was like, wow, there's a whole group of people out there that know this stuff and they're doing it. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> So, oh, I lost my thought. Where am I going, Lord? Um, yeah, the spirit of... Thank you, Lord. Yes, that scripture I hadn't seen before. So um, I went to the scripture, and I'm like asking the Lord, what is going on, and what do I do about it? And the Lord took me to a scripture in the books of the law, which I didn't prepare, so I don't know exactly where it is, but it says, you shall not raise up an Asherah beside the altar of the Lord your God. And I, you know, I didn't know anything about Asherah. I didn't know anything about Baal. I just knew that's what the Lord was telling me. That's what was happening with that, what I was facing. That they were raising up another God beside him. Worshiping, the, in that case, the denomination or the organization within the denomination. But we, we can't see it until that spirit of grace and supplication is poured out. So then Zechariah says, when we do see it and when we mourn, see, we have to give ourselves permission to grieve. And the Lord says that he promises to comfort those who mourn. He promises, you know, in Isaiah 61, he's going to turn our mourning into dancing. We, we try to skip over the mourning part. And that mourning is a, is a grief over sin, but it's also a grief over loss. See, the South couldn't grieve over their loss because they couldn't admit that it was sin that led to the loss. <laughs> they couldn't admit that, they, that that was needless bloodshed. They had to try to make it something grand and glorious and glorify it. And so they c- completely cut out just grieving. I mean, we need to grieve over those children that have been aborted. And it's not something that we try to make happen. It's a grief. When the Lord leads us to repentance and grief, it, it comes in, into our spirit. It's not something, you know, we, we, we get ourselves lost in it forever, and it's not something that's out of our mind or out of our soul. It's out of our spirit. So the Lord sends that grief into our spirit, and it's like this burning, searing thing of, of deep mourning. And then the Lord says, on that day, I will, um, I, I will cleanse. And on that day, I'll heal. So that grief is just a momentary thing, like when Isaiah saw the, you know, um, saw the Lord lifted up. And the train of his robe filling the temple. And he said, Lord, I have sinned, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. There's that grief. And immediately the Lord touched his lips with the coal. So the morning, we can't bypass it, but when we move into it, then the Lord comforts and, t- and changes. And in Zechariah 13, 1, he says, On that day a fountain will be open to cleanse them from sin and impurity. I'm leaving out the house of David and and Israel because, again, we're asking the Lord to do it here. On that day, I will banish the names of the idols from the land, and they will be remembered no more, declares the Lord Almighty. On that day, I will remove the spirit of impurity from the land. And then in Zechariah 14, 8 through 9, on that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem. Half of it to the east to the Dead Sea and half of it west to the Mediterranean Sea. But I'm thinking the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. (laughs) In summer and in winter, the Lord will be king over the whole earth. And and yes, ultimately, that is exactly what he's going to do. But this word earth also means land. So the Lord will be king over the whole land. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name. The only name. So when we cry for a spirit of grace and supplication, all of that is what we're releasing. As we cry for it and then we press into it, when the Lord shows us our sin, and we say, we've got to repent today, we've got to deal with this. And the first thing we have to deal with, if you look back at page 2 of your handout, we have to deal with that unholy blood covenant. Because that's what's holding everything else in place. We've tried to deal with some roots. We tried to deal with racism. We tried to deal with division. We tried to deal with this and that and the other. And here it still is. And we're going, why isn't this gone? Because that unholy blood covenant is holding it in place. 
And we only annul a covenant by a higher covenant. Which is a wonderful thing and a very, very frightening thing. Um, I think I left the page where I had the... Oh, yes. The only higher covenant is the covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ. But listen to this and think about... Judy's been saying we need to restore the communion to the church. Well, this is why it's gone, Judy. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the cup, the bread that we break, a participation in the body of Christ? This is 1 Corinthians 10. And verses 16, it goes down to 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord in the cup of demons too. Remember the baptism of blood? If we're trying to drink the cup of the Lord in allegiance to any other covenant, then we're doing this very thing. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. So we may be going through the motions, but God's counting it. It's not effective. It's not accomplishing what he's, he set communion to accomplish. And let me say something here too. Um, I don't have time to go into this, but in, in uh, order to keep the attention off of the main things in the years after the Civil War and after Reconstruction, the South's number one sin issue became drinking. And so within a space of 10 years, the church in the South went from denouncing the Women's Christian Temperance Union for destroying the Lord's Supper by introducing something other than wine to proclaiming that anything to do with any alcohol of any kind whatsoever was sin. Now think on that. Again, drunkenness is a sin, okay? (laughs) But... I would suggest to you that when you're breaking off religious structures here and and dealing, it would be wise to take communion with wine. That's what he gave it to. Yeah. So you deal with that. I didn't mean to bring that up today, but anyway. Yes. Say that. Melchizedek. Yeah. Yes. You know, and if you know if that's an issue for you and you don't need to touch a drop of wine or if somebody, you know, I mean, be wise about that, but don't let that drop because that was a big religious thing that the that's out literally within the space of 10 years. I've got two quotes where they're denouncing the women's Christian Temperance Union because they were in the north. And and they were, you know, calling it it wrong to have wine at the Lord's Supper. This is 18 80? See, we've thought, in our, in our minds, we've thought that, you know, not using wine for the Lord's Supper went back to probably John the Baptist. But, um, <laughs> 150 years ago, it wasn't an issue. <laughs> okay. Another quote. Someone who disregards the Torah of Moses is put to death without mercy on the word of two or three witnesses. Think how much worse will be the punishment deserved by someone who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, who has treated as something common the blood of the covenant which made him holy, and who has insulted the Spirit, giver of God's grace. So we have got to, in utter humility, confess our sin of agreeing with unholy blood covenant. And... Yes, we have divorced Baal, but I think the Lord is showing us this is, this is how Baal looks in the church and, and with the knowledge that this is what we're annulling. This is what we're getting out of. Now we're saying, Lord, you alone are Lord. Then we can repent for the bloodshed on the land. We can repent for not hating the bloodshed, but rather glorifying it. And we can repent for openly disagreeing with the bloodshed while personally and privately sometimes agreeing with it, allowing it. Um, 
and then we can uproot the rotten roots and replace the godly ones. You know, in the South, long before there was cotton, long before there was cotton, the South was covered with forests. I don't know if you noticed on the map I showed you earlier, but you'll see it when you look it up, that there's a whole lot of green across the South because the South was covered with forests. Originally, the South had an oak root, a deep tap root, a God-given tap root. And then we, people came along and planted a cotton tap root and said, this is your real identity. And, and they began to worship it, and they began to decide, this is who we really are. And it turned all rotten and ugly, and they still kept, they, they didn't want to look at that or say anything, because that would mean that, that then we couldn't be who we really are. But that's not who we really are. So we pull up that ugly little small cotton tap root and, and then we replant the root of the Lord that says they will be called mighty oaks, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. So uh, just a couple of things that I wrote um, and then we'll go back to what we're going to do here. One is I think it would be really wise for us to go to each of the battle sites, those 381 battle sites, with this in mind and to divorce Baal, to, to go through all these steps of annulling these unholy covenants, all the steps that were on the last uh, slide, and do that at the battle sites, taking communion, rejoicing with the Lord after we've grieved and repented and, and repented to each other. And I think it would be really good for some of you who are in the 25 states that don't have Civil War battle sites to come to the places where there are so that we can repent and receive from each other and, he and help... Uh, help carry that out now that's just i'm throwing that out there i don't know how it will work but that's what i'm uh, suggesting another thing that john mentioned yesterday uh, because the southern baptist convention is a linchpin here in the system because all the denominations all the church um agreed with that baptism of blood teaching that lost cause teaching and so they all entered into the covenant but the southern baptist was the one that made it in writing as a convention with the government as a, and so I think it might be good as we went to some of the national sites to repent and go through all these steps to, to go to the state Baptist convention site and go through these steps. Um, and then I'm, this teaching, as extended as it has become, um, is, is really only a small part of what God's uncovered. And I'm writing a book. I would love intercessors to help me get that thing finished. And also, I'm um, sponsoring a time in April, the same week as in Olive Branch, Mississippi, the same week as the Civil War started 150 years ago, for an extended look at this in time of repentance and confession and worship and letting God see what he's going to do to pour out that spirit of grace and supplication. And, and I'm available to come where you are um, to do the same thing. So this, this is not a one-time thing. This is a, over a period of time thing that we, I believe, must do if we're going to have authority in any of the other areas that we've talked about. I think Can we go back to that to... last slide? There, that one. Okay, excuse me. I just want them to see that. I think it'd be wrong for us to leave today if we didn't begin this process right now. Uh, and actually, when Millard was talking about Roman Catholicism, I thought we needed to begin to do that. Um, Deborah, would you make it simpler for us on uh, this? What you've done is really good. You almost got it done pretty clear. Uh, but it's real simple about what you think that ought to be done at the Civil War battle sites specifically. Okay, it's... it's and uh, if you could put that together, then we'll look at it and we'll see how to do it. And, uh, Lord, we just ask you to direct us in, in this as we act on this word. We want to be immediately obedient to the extent that we know how in this word that you've said to us. So... Uh, Deborah, why don't you tell us uh, what you would propose that we do right now in repentance? Okay. Um, I believe we need to acknowledge that every unholy blood covenant that has been made is unholy and wrong and acknowledge any sin of ourselves or our ancestors in agreeing with such a covenant. 
So I, get, I will say it, and then if you can agree with me, you just agree, okay? Father, we acknowledge that our... <laughs> Father, we acknowledge that our blood covenant with Jesus Christ is alone the covenant of our allegiance. Jesus Christ alone is Lord. His blood alone cleanses and sanctifies. His body alone has given us wholeness. And we repent and annul any covenant, and particularly any blood covenant that has been entered into by our ancestors or by us or has been agreed to without our knowledge. And we, in the name of that blood covenant of Jesus, we break every other covenant. Father, we acknowledge that that unholy covenants hold strongholds in place. And so, would you ask the Lord even now, now this is a continuing work, but is there, is there one stronghold or something that comes to your mind that God is saying that right now you, need to, you know that's been held in place by unholy covenants in your life? Maybe it's fear. We talked about fear. Maybe it's some of those other things. Would you personally out loud repent to the Lord for any injustice, unrighteousness that you know has link, been linked to such covenants? Maybe it's bitterness. As you're doing that, here's what I want to propose to do. If, okay. if you identified as your background as Southern Baptist, would you come stand with Deborah as she and all of you repent to the Lord mm-hmm. first, and then we'll see how he leads us in repenting to each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fine. It's up to you. How, how are you identified? If it's you, your family line, whatever your husband, whatever. Would you just come stand here? I was not, but we'll, we'll we won't make you one. leave. Huh? We won't make you leave. Okay. <laughs> I was a heathen. I was a Methodist. <laughs> okay. I suggest okay. that uh, we get down on our knees and yes. Deborah, would you yes. pray on but Let's ask the Lord. Okay, I want to ask you if you have... We're going to repent to those who weren't Southern Baptists. Uh, we need, I mean, there's hurts within, okay? But we're going to repent to you who weren't. So if you know of that you, your family, anyone that you know has been hurt by not only Southern Baptists, but this whole thing, root thing that we talked about. It may not be Southern Baptists. It may have been in your own church where this kind of thing was coming forth and you didn't know the root of it. If you just remain standing, if, if you haven't been hurt and you want to sit, <laughs> yeah. We all have to yeah, back here we'll all raise our hands. Because when you're in it, everybody that's in it has been hurt by it. I mean, 